from D. James Kennedy Ministries. This is Kennedy Classics. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Hello and welcome back to Kennedy Classics, a media outreach of D. James Kennedy Ministries. My name is Frank Wright and I invite you to visit our ministry website at djameskennedy.org where you can find a robust collection of great digital, audio, video and print resources. One of C.S. Lewis's most intriguing novels is in the form of a collection of letters from a well-seasoned veteran demon named Screwtape written to his nephew Wormwood, a younger and inexperienced demon apprentice. In one letter, Screwtape exhorts Wormwood to not focus so much on temptations that might lead to dramatic wickedness. The only thing that matters, says Screwtape, is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. To Screwtape, the enemy is God himself. In Dr. Kennedy's message today, he highlights three major shifts in the press of life that tend to keep us separated from God. Can you guess what these three things are? Well, we can find a hint in another of Screwtape's exhortations where he says, Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, and without signposts. But there is an exit ramp off this road to oblivion. Here is Dr. D. James Kennedy with his message, Beside the Still Waters. Our scripture lesson this morning is one of the most familiar in all of Holy Writ, the 23rd Psalm. I believe also one of the most loved as well. May we hear the inspired word of our God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And may God speak to us this day through this portion of his holy word and may his name evermore be praised. Amen. There are three changes which have taken place in our daily lives in the 20th century that most people take for granted and seldom think about at all. But they're things that are happening differently than things have ever happened to human beings before. First of all, life has been speeded up immeasurably. With the advent of the automobile, and then the airplane, and the jet airplane, and the telephone, all of these things, as well as computers and many other discoveries, have caused life to be as if it were a motion picture that were being played at a very high speed. This also results, secondly, in a speeding up and an increase of the number of changes that take place in our lives. Now, many people don't realize, but recent medical discoveries have shown that change of any sort can be very, very devastating to the human body. Well, with the speeding up of life, changes take, much, take place much more rapidly. And thirdly, there's been a great increase in the volume of life. Not only its speed and change, but also its volume. People wake up to alarm clock radios. They turn off the radio only to go in and have breakfast with the television on. 
Then they get in their car to go to work and turn on the engine, and then they turn on the radio, or they get to their office and there's music coming out over the sound system. The same thing happens, they come home at night. The television is on again. There's noise all of the time, as well as all of the other industrial noises that surround us. The effects of all of this have only in recent decades begun to be appreciated. The effects of stress on the human body, mind, and soul. And those effects, indeed, are disturbing, to say the least. Today, over one million people die each year from stress-induced heart attacks, not to mention all of the people who get cancer and a multitude of other diseases brought on by stress. Two-thirds of all doctor's visits to family doctors are now caused by stress-related illnesses, two-thirds of them. Well, what is this thing called stress? Some people have said it's simply the wear and tear of the body, but it's far more than that. You know that when people were face, are faced with some sort of an emergency or a danger, their body has certain chemical changes that takes place. The hypothalamus releases a certain drug and adrenaline is released into the blood and it's what is called the fight or flight syndrome. And uh, it is very essential under some conditions. But the problem is that when that syndrome or response is triggered too many times, you get a change a perceptible chemical change that takes place in the body which upsets the whole bodily chemistry and brings about enormous physical and mental and spiritual consequences. In fact, the number of different kinds of ailments that can be caused by stress is indeed startling. Are you suffering from any of the uh, effects of stress? One gentleman said, everything I read he had. Let's see, you make your own checklist. Here are some of the things that can be induced by stress. Worry, nervousness, tension, irritability, anger, impatience, fear, insecurity, insomnia, irregular breathing, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, trembling, depression, inability to sit still, inability to have fun, lack of contentment, indigestion, stomach problems, headaches, backaches, dizziness, mood swings, desire to avoid people, excessive sleep and naps, crying spells, nightmares, taking tranquilizers, facial wrinkles, fatigue, frustration, hyperactivity, unexplained itching, heart racing, palpitations, preoccupation, restlessness, loss of concentration, nervous tics, ulcers, unexplained aches and pains, swing in blood sugar, inability to relax, guilt, helplessness, hopelessness, sinking feelings, and on and on it goes. Did I hit anybody? Did I miss anybody? Not only do these large traumatic episodes such as death or loss of job or change of job, but also other things like a marriage scores very high because that's a change. All of these changes don't have to be unpleasant. Even uh, such things as moving to another location creates stress. And the thing that they have learned is that stress is cumulative. You may go through a very stressful episode and you think you're over it three months later, but you're not. It is cumulative and you store this up month after month, year after year, until you reach a point of your stress threshold beyond which you cannot tolerate it anymore and at that point something happens, you break down. Another thing that they have discovered about stress, and that is that there are two kinds of people when it comes to facing stress. They're called personality type A and type B. Let's see which one you fit in. Sometime people are somewhere between them. Personality type A is results oriented. He is achievement oriented. Time urgency fills his life. He has high expectation of self and others. He is impatient 
often aggressive and competitive. He has frustration if he doesn't meet his goals. He has guilt feelings about taking a vacation or resting. He's suffering from the hurry sickness. I wonder how many type A's we have here. Well, if you're type A, let me say that you're probably one of this world's go-getters. You're the type that goes out and gets the job done. You can't stand to see somebody dawdle along and not get there on time. You can't stand driving behind somebody that drives too slow. You can't stand waiting in a line. You can't stand going and sitting in the doctor's office and waiting. You're an impatient person, you're on the go, and you're heading upward. Well, let me tell you this. You have seven times greater risk of having a heart attack than type B. In fact, studies have shown that 72 to 85 percent of all people who have had heart attacks are type A people. And you also have high risk of having a vast array of other diseases, from cancer to everything else that I mentioned on that list. Type B is just about the opposite of all of those things. He's more people-oriented than he is goal-oriented. He's the kind that takes time to smell the flowers. He's the type that drives at uh, 40 miles an hour in a 45 mile an hour speed zone with you behind him. <laughs> He's more interested in the process of life than in the product of life. And uh, he's more like the tortoise than the hare. The hare, of course, is type A. And uh, the interesting thing about these two people is that though type A is the kind that goes out there and gets the job done, he usually doesn't live long enough to enjoy the results of his labors. Somebody once said that uh, a gold-lined casket is not really the goal of life, but type A often seems to think that's something like that. And, uh, Type B, the tortoise, is probably going to come dawdling by one of these days and see the hare belly up with a heart attack. And uh, the tortoise is going to go on, and he may very well accomplish more in the long run for the simple reason he'll probably outlive the hare by 30 years and most certainly will enjoy life more. Type A, accomplishes more, has more, does more, sees more, and enjoys less than type B does. He is the type that can really get his kicks looking at a flower and enjoying his child or a dog or whatever. And uh, they have noticed that these types are very, very significant when it comes to dealing with stress. Well, what can be done? about this devastating problem that is taking so many lives and robbing so many more of their fullness. Well, I'd like to talk about three different areas. First of all, the, the mental. I'm going to talk about the mind and the body and the soul. In the mental aspect of this, the psychological aspect, let me say that a person can indeed change from a type A to a type B by simply mental effort to do so. He can come to the conclusion that this is not the smartest thing in the world, that the, the race is not necessarily to the swift, and that life is not dependent upon how far we go, and that results are not really the most important thing. You know, many people are offended when they read the story of Mary and Martha. I would venture to say if you let 100 secular types read that, they would say that Martha, who was very busy tending to the guests and fixing the food and everything after the traumatic event of Lazarus's death, was certainly the hero of the plot, and Mary, do-nothing Mary, who was sitting there at the feet of Jesus listening to him, was certainly the lesser of the two, whereas Jesus said to Mary, she hath chosen the better part. I want to tell you that is a lesson that type A's need to learn. 
They need to hear afresh, be still and know that I am God. They need to know that sitting and listening to the word of Christ may be more important than the activity that everyone else may be applauding. They need to learn how to change their thinking about what's really important in life. Also under the psychological aspects of it, let me quote something which I like very much. It comes from Dr. Robert Elliott, who is a professor of cardiology, and he has two rules for how to cope with stress. And I think you ought to write these down, write them down on the wall of your mind, your heart, put them up on the wall on your refrigerator or wherever, someplace you ought to have those. Now, I, I should warn you that he is a professor of cardiology, so this is medical language. You have to really be sharp to get the meaning. Rule number one. Don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> Were you able to understand that? Rule number two, everything is small stuff. <laughs> That's it. That's how to cope with stress. I want to tell you that could give you a change of perspective in your life that could be enormous. You know, we often lose sight of what is and isn't small stuff. We've all heard that you can take a quarter and hold it up in front of your face and it'll blot out the sun, completely cover the sun, and appear to be larger than the sun. We need to get a perspective on things. We need to get a cosmic perspective. Eliot also has another maxim I think it's worth repeating. He says, he's talking about the <clears throat> fight or flight response, and he says, if you can't fight and you can't flee, flow. And I think there's something to that too. And a Christian has something to flow on. He has the river of God's mercy and providence that he can cast himself into. He knows that underneath are the everlasting arms of God. He has the promise that God will work all things together for his good so he can go with the flow. He can just trust God to work it out, leave it with the Lord, realize that he's not running the world. He himself is, that God is. And he can flow with it. So I urge you to remember those rules. And also, under the mental aspect of it, we should realize that stress, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder. They talk about stressors, things which stress people, but they've come to realize that there really isn't any such thing as a stressor that it's actually people's response to various things, which in some cases stress some people, in other cases don't bother them at all. I know people who the thought of walking across Federal Highway would get them all a dither. I know other people who would find it fun, especially if there was a lot of traffic to dance between. <laughs> And that depends upon our personality. I know people who uh, would have a heart attack when they're told that a hurricane is coming here. I personally enjoy hurricanes, but uh, I guess that's part of a personal idiosyncrasy. So people respond to different things. <clears throat> a book written by the Alcorns talks about a person who went camping and steps out of his tent and sees a wolf coming about 30 feet away. Now that would be called a stressor. I don't know what kind of stress that would create in you. Perhaps you would just faint dead away. However, if you were a hunter with a powerful gun, a high-powered gun, rifle in your hands, and you hadn't eaten for three days, I assure you you would have a completely different reaction. 
to that wolf. You would see wolf steak. <laughs> Some people like wolf steak. <laughs> so we need to keep in mind that we are not the helpless objects of these stressors, that it is we who ourselves who create the stress reactions by our response to these things. So much for the psychological, mental aspect of it. As far as the bodily aspect of it is concerned, it has been discovered that regular exercise is absolutely vital for dissipating the accumulating stress that builds up in the body. And therefore, if you are not getting exercise, you are simply inviting all sorts of additional problems. So I would urge you to get some regular exercise, even if it's only walking every day, that would be better than, than doing nothing. And thirdly, the spiritual aspect of it. One of my favorite passages of Scripture, the 23rd Psalm, he leadeth me beside the still waters. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Over and over again, the Bible calls us to stillness. And in this hectic, frenetic, busy, noisy world, we need to get away to a place where it is calm, a place where it is quiet, that place of quiet rest. We need a time to be alone with the Lord. Studies have shown that a time of meditation or prayer does perhaps more than anything else to remove stress. So I would urge you that several times a day that you come aside to a quiet place, some place where you can sit down, read the Word of God, meditate upon it, and pray to Him and be quiet before God. Be still and know that he is God. Be still and know the salvation of God. Be still and know his love and his care and his mercy and his grace for you. Do that and God will indeed bless your life. He said to Elijah, who had just been through a very stressful experience with King, King Ahab, what did God say to him? <clears throat> he said, hide thyself by the brook Cherith. That was God's prescription for a very overstressed prophet. Hide thyself by the brook Cherith. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Someone said that he liked to take one minute vacations, to go in his mind to some pleasant place, and there to wait. But you need to spend time. You know, you need to spend 20 or 30 minutes at a time taking time to pray, to meditate, to read God's Word, and to let Him restore your soul. You notice that right after these pleasant meadows, these quiet waters, He restoreth my soul. And if you would like to know the peace of God and the joy of God, then that's where you will find it. Think about Jesus Christ, the altogether lovely one. You know, Jesus didn't come to any quiet waters. All of thy waves and thy billows have gone over me, he said. All of the sand of the stress of life caused by sin was poured into him. He endured all of the wrath and the anguish that mankind could know. He endured it all in our place. He took our sins upon himself. He died in our stead. And he offers us eternal life if we will trust in him. But we need to come and rest in him. We need to give God time to heal us and to cure us and to build us up and to strengthen us in him. We need to trust in Christ and find that place of quiet rest. Said one poet, slow me down, Lord. Ease the pounding of my heart by the quieting of my mind. Steady my hurried pace with a vision of the eternal reach of time. Give me amid the confusion of the day the calmness 
of the everlasting hills. Let me look upward to the towering oak and know that it grew great and strong because it grew slowly and well. May we pray. Father, help us to find that place of quiet rest and determine that we are going to overcome the effects of stress, to know the peace that passeth understanding, to give thee time to work thy perfect will in our lives. Help us, we pray, O God, to learn to grow wisely and well, that we may grow great for thee. For Jesus' sake, amen. For those who know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, there is peace even in the midst of the upheavals and uncertainties of this life. Do you know this peace? Do you know this joy? Or are you living in fear for what tomorrow may bring? You don't have to. Today you can turn your life over to Jesus Christ, who's come to give you life to the full, filled with peace and joy. To do that, we can go together in prayer right now saying, Lord Jesus Christ, I want to know the peace that you have come to give. I want to know the joy of salvation that you paid for on the cross. Thank you for dying for my sins and for forgiving me and cleansing me and giving me hope eternal. I place my trust in you from this day forward. In your name I pray, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, we have a book written by Dr. Kennedy to help you grow in your understanding of the Christian faith. It's called Beginning Again, and it's yours when you write to the address on your screen or call the toll-free number. Just ask for Beginning Again. God bless you as you do. As Dr. Kennedy shared with us today, modern life is often stressful life. The effects of worry and stress can cause us massive bodily harm and even worse, spiritual harm. The stresses of modern life can be used by the enemy to drive a wedge between God and us. But in the place of anxiety and worry, the Lord offers us rest and refreshment. He invites us to lie down in green pastures and to stroll with Him alongside the still waters. You may want to watch this message again as a tonic for stress, or even share it with a friend who needs to hear it. We'll be glad to send you a DVD or CD copy of this program as our thanks for a generous donation of any amount to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at Box 6087, Albert Lee, Minnesota 56007, or call toll free 888-633-1728 or go online to djameskennedy.org. Your donation will also help us continue broadcasting powerful biblical gospel-filled messages like this one to as many people as possible. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for joining us on Kennedy Classics. We'll see you next time. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.